advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Ready for the new partnership audit rules, tax, regulatory, and practical considerations. My name is Annie Tribaletti, and I will be your moderator. Joining us today are Phil Gross, Robert Schachter, and Dave Straub. Phil chairs the tax department for Kleinberg Kaplan and advises clients on the taxation of hedge funds. He counsels clients on structuring funds, structuring investment manager, managers, and general partners, compensating managers and employees, investing in funds, and seeding management entities. Robert is a tax partner based in Witham's New York City office. He has over 30 years of public accounting experience and is a licensed, certified public accountant in the states of New York and New Jersey. Robert's experience includes transactions involving a variety of financial products, derivatives, tax-efficient trading, and investment strategies. Dave is responsible for the growth of new business in all of the division's business segments at CSC, including corporate trust, agent, independent director, SPE management, and default administration. His primary market focus includes mergers and acquisitions, structured finance, financial technology, real estate, and restructuring. And with that, let's welcome Phil, Robert, and Dave. Thanks, Annie. This is Dave with CSC. CSC has been a leader in providing business services focused on helping companies stay in compliance for 120 years. We were approached in 2017 by a law firm asking us if we would serve as the partnership representative for their clients. As we developed our service agreement, we were also asked by the IRS to meet with them in Washington, D.C. to learn what we felt was important in helping companies meet the requirements of this new regulation. As the first filing date approaches, we thought it would be good to offer this seminar. Today we have two experts that will review the partnership audit rules, help us understand who can qualify as a partnership representative, review important considerations when appointing a partnership representative, share ideas of who should serve as the partnership representative, summarize the new partnership representative prov provisions, and just before a time for questions, I will wrap up with additional considerations. Over to you, Robert and Phil. Thank, thank you. This is Robert Schachter from Witham. Um, starting with the, with the uh, new partnership rules, uh, we wanted to go through a history of where we got to be here today. So the starting point really began in 1982, where they enacted, uh, the IRS and Treasury enacted the Tax Matters Partner. That partner was responsible for handling 100% of a partnership's tax examination issues and was to be reported on a tax return. In 2015, a new law came through for the bipartisan, in the Bipartisan Budget Act which caught people by surprise. Many people weren't aware of it, and it basically said that there were new partnership rules that were to take effect uh, for tax examinations by the IRS, beginning with calendar, with years beginning uh, January 1st, 2018. One of the rules that got implemented, which is the reason behind the, the, the webinar today, is they enacted, instead of a tax matters partner, they put in a rule, a special designation called a partnership representative. And the partnership representative is an all empowering and encompassing individual now during a tax examination and takes a lot of responsibility. They enacted many rules which changed the way a partnership was going to be looked at and audited. Basically, the general rule is, is that the partnership gets audited by the IRS and in the year of audit, not the year that they are auditing, meaning let's go and say that they're auditing 2018, but in 2020 the audit is taking place. The general rule is that the changes go to the partnership that is in 2020 and doesn't get uh, extended to the partners in that partnership. The partnership basically pays for the partners. 
There are other situations that a partnership representative can make changes to that rule, but that we will talk about later. And as time went on, after 2015, there were many uh, issues that have evolved from the initial uh, statutes that got enacted and proposed and final regulations were effectuated. And if someone would like more detail in that, Phil and I can go over that in questions later or after the seminar, after, after the webinar has concluded. So, the new partnership audit rules, as I noted, replace the tax matters partner. The partnership representative must be named on a tax return in 2018. The, tax, the partnership representative uh, will designate uh, everything for the partnership as to what is going to happen during that audit. The items that are required to be reported on the 2018 return, an entity can be named as representative for the partnership, but an individual must be named underneath that uh, entity's name, if, if an entity is named. And then, not only do you have to report that information, but you are required to report a TIN, a taxpayer identification number. The partnership representative must be a U.S. person, uh, have situs to a U.S. source base, and must have a phone number and report their TIN. What is a TIN? A TIN could be anything from a social security number, a taxpayer identification number reported by the, uh, given by the IRS if they don't have a social security number. It can be the PTIN or preparer's taxpayer identification number, as well as there are a couple other items that they have reported what qualifies as a TIN. Phil is going to talk to you about the next several slides. And just as a background to the new audit rules, the audit, the, the number of audits of, of partnerships prior to these rules was very small. I think it was like uh, on a relative basis next to large corporations, which was like 27 percent, was like less than a, a percent. So it was very small. And even on those audits, the IRS collected very little taxes. So the purpose of these new rules is really to enable the IRS to audit partnerships and collect taxes from partnerships. And so that, and uh, we can expect because of that, that there will be more partnership audits and more taxes collected in those audits. And this is also due in part that the number of partnerships have proliferated as well. As Robert said, the old audit rules were enacted in 1982. And since that time, the number of LLCs taxed as partnerships in the U.S. and just partnerships generally has, has, uh, has grown significantly. Um, so the, again, the overall idea of these rules is to, is to increase the number of audits. Under the rules, which again referred to some of the BBA because of the uh, Bipartisan um, business, business Act of 2015, Budget Act of 2015, um, again, the adjustments are generally done at the partnership level, and then the taxes, penalties, and interest are also computed at the partnership and paid at the partnership level. And we'll get into different abilities to shift that from the partnership itself, but they get pretty complex. Uh, it applies to all partnerships so uh, that file U.S. tax returns. So whether you're a foreign entity that's checked the box to be a partnership for U.S. tax purposes, or whether you're U.S. LLC or U.S. partnership, this tax is a partnership. The new rules apply it to you. Um, there are a number of elections we'll get into. This isn't going to be where we get into all the details of the rules. I think we're going to try to emphasize what you need to know now and what you need to do now, rather than the, the level of difficulties or nuances in the rules. Which are, they are very complex. Um, so there is an ability to elect out for certain partnerships. A lot of partnerships will not, will not meet those requirements. The partnership must have less than 100 partners, and you can't have certain partners that are not eligible partners, such as a partnership or trust or a disregarded entity. If you elect out of the partnership rules, you're actually back in the pre tefer rules, which said that every partner is audited separately. Now, I didn't write these rules. I think, I think 100 partner was... These rules have a lot of issues. I think they ended up coming out okay at the end of the day, but one of the things that I always thought wasn't a good rule is 100 partners. I think that was way too many, but they should have had the lower number but more ability to elect out. But anyway, that's, that's my view. But as it is what it is. It is 100 partners, and, and 
Many partnerships will not be all left out. In a typical case, let's say you have a, a partnership, the general, a limited partnership or a limited liability company and the general partner or the managing member is typically an entity itself, the partnership itself, and that knocks out the ability of, of your of the partnership under audit to elect out. And also, Phil, S corporations you look through in the in the mm -hmm. count in the count of one hundred. Correct. So an S corporation is eligible. I think there's only about the, the qualified S sub might not be, but the, the S corporation itself is. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the idea is that the IRS only really wants to deal with one person, so that they're generally limited to dealing with the partnership representative, and the partnership representative will have various powers that we'll discuss later. Um, there is a power of attorney way to have other individual uh, partners to participate, but uh, right now I think when you're going looking at this, you have to consider this the partnership representative. Again, this is, we're not going to get into the overall complexities. We'll get into some of the nuances uh, and rules. I think as Robert said, they apply to audits of taxable years beginning on or after January 1st, 2018. So your prior law still applies for audits of, let's say, 2017 years. So you can't just wipe the, forget about all those rules and, and just learn the new rules. Um, again, it says who needs a partnership representative of U.S. partnerships and foreign partnerships that are required to file U.S. tax returns. A lot, a typical case may be where you have a, and I deal a lot with various funds, hedge funds, private equity funds, and whatnot. The typical case may be where the, the, there's a foreign manager and sets up a U.S. partnership for U.S. investors. And the other partnership representative needs to meet certain rules, which Robert mentioned. Um, and the partnership representative, if it's an entity, it designates a, a designated individual to be that entity. And we'll get into the details of how you actually do that designation of, of both of them. And it must have, again, meet certain U.S. presence requirements. So certain foreign partnerships in particular might not meet those requirements. And we'll get into what those one, uh, who they want as partnership representative or in certain circumstances, maybe domestic partnerships. Um, even with domestic people may want an independent partnership representative. The partnership representative as basically, the idea was that the IRS wants to just deal with the partnership representative and the partnership has all powers under the code. Um, so we'll get into later how you might narrow that contractually with the partnership representative, or at least facing the IRS, the partnership representative has all the power, and the partnership representative does not have to provide notice or any other information basically to partners, uh, again, unless we do it contractually, but not not vis-a-vis -vis the IRS. Under the old law, the tax matters partner did not have such power. It would deal with the IRS, but it had to provide notices to the all partners, and each partner had a right to participate in an audit. So again, the, the, net, the IRS just found that unwieldy. The partnership is designated each year. Um, so whoever you designate in 2018 doesn't necessarily have to be the 2019 person. Most likely you're going to be consistent, but you don't have to be. Um, and there's either ways to resign or revoke an election. Otherwise, the partnership representative stays in effect. Usually, you can't change it until you're under audit. Uh, and then there's different procedures to actually change it, you know, for the person to resign is it, or for the partnership to revoke the partnership representative as the actual partnership representative. So, basically, what you've got going here is all the rules have changed from the past. So, let's look at, say, if you haven't, if, if a partnership is in a pre-existing partnership, one of the things that the, the partnership should immediately do if they haven't designated is they need to look at their documents. Um, it's very important because TMP or Tax Matters Partner does not exactly work into the new rules for partnership representative, and there may be some designations in your partnership agreement that may not assist the new person that is required to handle all partnership matters. So appointment is valid until affirmative action is taken, basically. What does that mean? That means that once the partnership representative is named, then that person uh, has to be with uh, the partnership as their representative until a tax examination occurs. When a tax examination occurs, that is when a partnership res representative gets notified by the IRS 
And then the partnership has the option to to actually revocate the partnership representative at that time or allow the partnership representative to handle the matters. Um, revocation by the partnership must be done in writing. As I noted, it's only effective if an audit has commenced. And the IRS has the responsibility of notifying the partnership and the partnership representative of the acceptance of the revocation. If they don't accept the revocation, believe it or not, one of the rules that the IRS has provided in their rules is it's okay if they revocate this person, but let's just say they don't accept the person that's going to be the new representative. The IRS can actually represent a person instead. That has not been cleared up in the regulations at this point as to why the IRS would come up with their own determination, but it looks like that I, it was my opinion, and Phil concur on this, is that it was set up that if it, a partnership representative wasn't named, that they could name somebody so that they'd have somebody in place, that it really wasn't the intention for them to go in and not let the partnership make a named partnership representative. So what are the powers of the partnership representative? Believe it or not, everything. They have all rights and assume all responsibility and take on a significant fiduciary responsibility. The broad uh, acts include settling and a tax examination, extend the partnership statute of limitations. The one that's big and key here is bind all partners to a settlement agreement decline to challenge, contest all or a part of an adjustment, and make any and all decisions on paying tax, including the push-out election, which is to push out the results, and that must be done within 45 days after the partnership audit has concluded. Um, dealing with this area is very significant, and before anybody would decide to do something like that, they should have a consultation with counsel and the partners in the partnership before anybody would consider doing that. But the partnership representative has the right to, believe it or not, to do that without consulting anybody. Um, the partnership representative, as noted in the next line, they're not required to consult or receive approval of actions from the partners. Normally, they would be in conjunction working with the general partner or the managing partner, depending upon if it was an, a limited partnership, general partnership, or a limited liability company. The implied powers of the partnership representative are they can hire an attorney, accountant, or other professional to work on their behalf. They can direct how advisors will work and what the issues will be, hire all experts, bind the partnership, direct access to the books and records, and charge the partnership for their time. And that is something significantly different than in the past because normally a tax matters partner is a partner that's in the partnership and never got remunerated for handling matters. Uh, it, it is my opinion that if somebody is going to charge for their time, it would be someone that is not associated with the partnership and is doing this as a professional service. The partnership re representative designation not in effect. As noted, if no partnership representative chosen on the return uh, or does not have U.S. substantial presence, uh, you need to get one that does have U.S. presence. The IRS will then, if you don't have somebody notified on the return, uh, will send notice to the partnership and the last known partnership representative if there was one. If there isn't one, they will designate one. Uh, and uh, there's 90 there's a 90 day period after the IRS designates a partnership representative to for the partnership to go out and get their own representative after that. So who should serve as your partnership representative? In general, um, we're seeing right now a partner that is in the partnership or somebody who has close ties to the partnership. And that's basically for the U.S. partners. For non-U.S. entities, we are finding that they are going to need somebody that's in the United States, A, that has a, a place to meet that is convenient for the IRS, not convenient for the re partnership representative. And they need a, a phone number that they can be contacted at, as well as making sure that they have access to the company's books and records if there was an examination. 
So the question then becomes, are potential conflicts fully vetted and addressed in with a partnership representative? It's very important that whoever you decide to utilize as your partnership representative doesn't have a conflict of interest. But at the same time, if you're the general partner and you pick yourself to be the partnership representative, there's always the potential for conflict. The question becomes, there's got to be a trust factor based upon what has been designated here by the IRS. At the same time, who accepts possible liability? Um, the partnership is responsible for paying all of the IRS audit changes that end up being effectuated in a tax examination. The question becomes, is there a potential liability and fiduciary responsibility that is thrown upon the partnership representative? And the answer is yes. I am not an attorney. Um, just so that everybody knows our firm as an accounting firm with them will not be a partnership representative. We prefer to handle tax examinations and prepare tax returns from the tax side. Um, we do not take any responsibility as far as trying to be a fiduciary for our clients. So who, who should have the binding authority and who will binding authority upset any balance among the partners? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, the binding authority is going to be with the partnership representative, and to state this over and over again, the partnership representative is the all and powerful Oz, as they say, in the old Wizard of Oz, and they theoretically have all the power to handle everything once they are named as the partnership re representative until they are revoked as being the partnership representative. Will the designated individual be around when the IRS sends a letter? That's an important item to note. Is it somebody that has a long-term presence with the partnership? That Now, if you hire somebody that's outside of the partnership, revocation can occur and you can hire somebody else. But understand if somebody is hired today and they're not going to be there five years from today, that's what you really have to look at. In most instances, five years from today doesn't matter. Statute of limitations is generally three years unless fraud is committed. And we, we would take the position that for this seminar or webinar that we are looking at entities that are going to be doing things by the letter of the law. So the statute of limitations would be three years. Who is best positioned to coordinate the right resources to get the best outcome? Um, from that answer, that answer would be to go with the, somebody who's related to the general partner or the partnership or the managing member of the LLC. Um, will the designated individual have the bandwidth to perform the role? If they are generally the people that are associated with the general partner or the managing member, the answer should be yes, because that's what they're doing as their normal occupation. Um, you want somebody that has the time to be able to handle this. If somebody doesn't normally handle something like this in the past, I would not name them even if they were part of the general partnership just to take on this role. Remember also that a partnership representative has the right to farm out the work to accountants, attorneys, et cetera, to handle all the work. They just have to be responsible for making certain decisions and that if they're not willing to make these decisions, they should put somebody in the role that is willing to make all the decisions for the partnership. If handled within the partnership, will the partnership representative have access to the books and records? And this is very important. Um, they've got to be given when they sign up as the partnership representative that they will have access to books and records because if that partner may no longer be active with the partnership at a later date or they utilize an outside uh, representative, they have to be given the rights to the books and records. And what we're doing is we are actually sending out a letter to all of our partnerships where the partnership is naming the entity, and then if it is an entity, the individual who has access to the books and records and it's signed off by, by, um, by the clients. So Phil, who should serve as your partnership representative going forward on the rest of these questions? Yeah, no, I think it will depend on the partnership itself. As you said, I think a lot of times it will, you know, it will be the general partnership and the general partner of the partnership or the managing member if there is one in the U.S., if not, like in a foreign partnership, then maybe someone like CSC, which you know, CSC will get into later. Um, and then who will be the designated individual will depend. I agree with you. Uh, when it first came out, I think a lot of 
people thought the accounting firms would take on the role of being the partnership representative, but that is not developed. Um, or that nor have, nor have uh, law firms taken that role as well. So it really will be the people associated with the partnership itself or someone like CSC. Um, and then that person, when they handle an audit, um, you'll have to weigh different things, different considerations in determining how to proceed. Um, if you have an outside audit, an outside person or even a designated individual, you're generally going to want to have a contract with them limiting what their authority is. When we get, actually, I want to step back a little bit as far as when we get into what the partnership agreements need to address. Because I think we've gone in a little bit more detail kind of on what the partnership audit rules are. As Robert said, there's a review year, which is the year under audit, and then there's the adjustment year. And it's just the year basically the audit's concluded. And the default rule is again that the taxes are paid at the partnership level. And there's various, either there's various selections. We said one is select out. You can elect out of the partnership audit rules, you should. Again, it's going to be very limited circumstances where you can, but if you can, and we'll get into why you should elect out. If you can elect out, then there's either the push out method, which Robert mentioned, it pushes out the changes uh, up to the partners, and even if those were passed through partners, generally up through those partners uh, to the ultimate partners, and has those partners are then re uh, required to file amended returns and pay the taxes due. Uh, the push out method is the, the way that changes work, it can be disastrous for the partners and the partnership because it can be where they just take positive changes and not negative changes. Actually, and, and, I'm sorry, if you, if you determine the tax at the partnership level, the taxes can be much worse than if the, if the, the numbers are passed through to the partners. Uh, they could just take the positive changes and not the negative changes, and you could, the, the amount of tax can be very high. Uh, if it's de minimis tax, you probably just pay it at the partnership level. Or if your partners maybe don't change from the year reviewed versus the year under uh, the adjustment year. So, for example, in a private equity fund where partners are basically static, you might have less concerns than like a hedge fund where there are differences. Uh, the number the partners change and can be pretty frequent changes or um, um, a lot of percentage changes in the, who the partners are and what their relative interests are. So, who your what type of partnership it is. What the tax asserted is will depend will impact what the partnership decides to do. Um, the partnership can try to reduce the taxes at the partnership level based on the characteristics of the partners. So if I'm in a partnership and it's not doing business in the U.S. and it's a big partner, but it's a foreign corporation, then that should reduce the, the amount asserted substantially. Um, and if it was all owned by, let's say, foreign corporations not not doing business in the U.S then it should reduce the tax asserted to zero. So you're going to have to weigh a lot of different considerations in, in how to proceed, whether you elect out, whether you try, how you try to minimize the tax, whether you try to push through the tax. You push through, again, there's, um, there's an a, a extra interest charge, so higher than normal interest charge on the amount due. So the numbers can, can add up, and obviously, as I said, initially, you can elect out, elect out. One thing, one thing to note also with that, Phil, is we've been in touch with many states, and I've just met with the director of tax for in New Jersey and New York, and both of them do not follow federal rules on this. They're trying to come up with a methodology, and they figure that they're going to try to come up with something by 2019. Mm -hmm. So understand there are no rules currently at the state level. So if you have a business and you're doing business in a given state, this does not apply at the current time for any state in the United States. And just an, another thing to consider when you're looking at your partnership agreements or deciding how to proceed, uh, it's going to be the case when, when a person invests in your partnership, they might want to see certain um, things in the operating agreement or how you end up offering them, and we'll get into that because they're basically buying into, let's say, potential liability. And also, if someone's just an M&A, you know, people are buying your partnership interest, um, that is also going to be now a consideration in uh, negotiating the purchase agreement and who, who bears liability for those uh, those taxes, too. So your partnership agreement needs to, one, and, and, and also we'll get into operating with uh, the PPMs and the subject structure agreements, but basically you need to designate the partnership representative. You could also designate the designated individual in there. We've been typically designating 
to the partnership representative and giving it the authority to designate the individual um, rather than doing both. Even under the, under the partnership rules, actually, the, the partnership itself could be the partnership representative, which sounds circular, but they allow that. It doesn't really mean much, but that that's potential. Um, I, I've been very flexible in, in our documents. We try to preserve um, all flexibility to the partnership itself because a lot of these rules, even though now they've, you know, they've been out there now for four years or so, there's been a lot of uh, regulations and guidance issued. There's still uncertainty until there's actually audits, in my view, until you actually see how these rules develop, how they're applied, uh, the facts and circumstances of your partnership. You really don't know certain things or how you lack. So I've been, you know, at first, I think like in 2016 and 17, a lot of side letters would try to pin down the partners. Um, the partnership, how it's going to react in, in, in all cases under audits. And we pushed back substantially on that. I think with a lot of uh, people, under, understandably, we, we basically didn't tie down our, our partnerships. Because we generally represent the partnerships, not the investors. But even when we represent the investors, we understand that you can't really tie the partnership down so much on, certain, on how they'll actually act in audit because you don't know what the audit will, will uh, what, the, what will be asserted. Um, so you need to address who the partnership representative. General language saying, you know, I've seen people put in three or four pages in the agreements exactly how they'll try to proceed in each different situation, and I just think that that's a huge mistake. We really had one or two paragraphs saying so and so will be the, G the partnership rep. He'll, he, they can make all the elections, determinations, and decisions. Um, all partners will provide information. Uh, as requested by the partnership representative for an audit, they'll amend their returns if they need to, and they'll reimburse the partnership for taxes, interest, and penalties to the extent it relates to their partnership interests. Um, so we will be very broad on, on that in, in the agreement. Um, and then the other thing is, um, is do you, are there any limits you know do, that we put in and we don't really put in the limits as i was saying earlier um we, we don't put in limits on the partnership rep but you might if you're an investor or you're in a partnership where there's three or four and you know not a large number of investors and maybe you can't you can't elect out because of who those partners are you might put in that you need to provide contractual notice to people um of who you know of when there's an audit, when there's material correspondence from or with the IRS, um, can they extend the statute of limitations? What authority do they have to settle disputes? Do they need to get everyone? Do they need to get a majority of partners? So you're going to try, particularly in a small partnership, in my view, to limit what the partnership representative can do without partner approval. If you hire someone like CSC, we'll get in. You're going to again put in even more limits, I think, in those types of contracts on what they can and can do without your approval. You know, you might put in, although I can't, I disagree with this, that you might put in whether someone, when and where, when they need to make the push out election that they can. I think that's a mistake. I think, I, I think a lot of this, you need flexibility as a partnership representative to try to get to the right result, which is the amount of tax that would have been apply you know it would have been determined if the review year uh, was adjusted and applied to the partners in the review year so see the extent you can get to that outcome you'll get to that you might not be able to um, and responsibilities of the other partners again we kind of put in the language that they uh, will provide information needed they'll amend returns if we want to qualify for the election out, that they won't transfer their partnership interest to partners that are not eligible. Um, you know, we haven't had that come up so much, but in a small partnership, you might. Um, for example, in the fund context, maybe the manager has just two or three principals which are individuals and they qualify to elect out, you might limit their ability to transfer interest in the, in the partnership to so they qualify. Again, even those a lot of times will not qualify because they'll have trust or other potentially ineligible partners in the uh, in the management entities. That's a, a good topic to bring up. You know, there's a lot of trusts that are out there that are investors after the fact. Uh, please note that grantor trusts are considered trusts for purposes that the IRS says that you cannot um, 
basically elect out. So if it was an individual and now it's not, the partnership representative becomes responsible for making sure that if they do something and represent it in front of the IRS, that all the partners are known. The IRS can actually, you could spend a lot of time, it looks like you could probably spend a lot of time if a partner is not the designated partner. And we've had this before where a partner was not changed on the partnership tax return in name because the social security number is still the ID number for the grantor trust. But at a later date, if you go through the whole rigmarole of doing this and then you elect out, let's just say, and the IRS finds out you're not allowed to elect out, it could create a severe issue on the partnership representative. So the partnership representative has to know all the facts and circumstances of what's going on in a partnership. They just can't be in the role of saying that they're in name only. I think uh, just a couple of things coming up now is, you know, I've gotten a number of questions. I've got to designate my partnership representative by March 15th. And that's not the case because I have some panic people. Who am I, who am I going to designate? What, or how do I designate? But it's the case. You have to do it with your 2018 return. So if you're on extension, you have past March 15th until you file the returns with it by September 15th. So it's not a next, you know, a next week or next two week type of issue generally because the money partnerships will go on extension this year. Um, and I think another thing to consider is will these new rules affect positions that your that you take on your tax return or that the accountants will are really willing to take on your tax return. And that remains to be seen, I think. Um, will people get more aggressive on whether they're a trader fund or investor fund or other tax positions? Again, I we'll see. I don't think so it will affect it generally. Um, I guess the last point is these rules are, are one of the major changes over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years, whatever, out there. And they got a lot of attention when they first came out in 15 because it was a dramatic change in the audit rules of partnerships. So there was a huge number of articles. The regulations are hundreds of pages. Um, they've gotten, you know, they aren't as significant now, I think, generally, just because people are more used to them. And they've, they've had time to digest them, although... You could spend a year just learning all the regs, and we could speak for hours and hours on them. Um, but I think there's also, I think there's so many other changes. I think it, it, you're gonna, it, we've heard less about the partnership audit rules than before because there's so many other new rules out there, and new regulations that are hundreds of pages on other topics such as investment, I mean, interest expense under 163J, guilty, and whatnot. So I think this is still a very important topic. We shouldn't. Forget about it. It's going to be important on your return. Mm -hmm. uh, the PR, and then the other thing you're going to have to do is just make sure your agreements have been changed. More so where you're like a hedge fund where the partners change, less so where private equity. But even that, I've suggested um, that they, they they should have changed their PPMs or operating agreements to address the partnership rep representation. Again, we are putting same as we put in a paragraph or two in the operating agreements. We're putting in a paragraph or two in the offering memorandums. Again, it's a risk factor in saying this and highlighting that the partnership or you may be liable for taxes for prior years and you agree to provide all such information. And we generally are putting in the subscription agreement as well that, you know, I, I understand this and I agree to provide such information. Now, what, the, what this has caused is for us accountants is a, an accounting quote unquote apocalyptic moment. Because an example would be in 2018, we have partners that are in a partnership in 2020. These partners are no longer in the partnership, and the partnership ownership percentages have changed. Um, Phil makes a great point as to some of the partnerships have designated in their partnership agreements indemnity clauses, or some of the partnerships I've actually been looking at, um, they've actually got a hold back where they're considering holding back funds. This is never positive when you've got to start implementing rules on people's partnership agreements where cash, the, when people leave a partnership, they want to be able to leave the partnership. And unfortunately, general partners or managing members have the issue of being concerned about if an audit occurs, making sure that somebody has the, the, the payment that's going to be appropriated from it because the partnership is responsible for paying it, not partners. I, I great point. And it does bring up the 1048 part, and I guess this, yes. is, this is not, again, the accountants have determined that this is not a 1048 
tax because it's not technically on the partnership, I guess, is the view. That's correct. So it's a partner it's, tax so, imposed on the partnership. Yeah. So it might, it's not going to be under 1048. It's an, under another standard potentially, which is a low, uh, which which makes it much less likely you're actually going to accrue these taxes on uh, on your GAAP accounting financial statements. And um, as an and as an account, the only thing that I will say is, if anybody that's on this webinar has not addressed their partnership documents, I'm not doing any slanting for an attorney to get a fee here. But it's very important that your document be updated because you are going to whoever the the GP or managing member is going to be what I call left on the hook. If decisions need to be made in the future and partners are no longer there, the general partner exposes himself to the representative if they're not going to be that person that's representing. And there's going to be issues between partners saying, I don't owe the money, and potentially a lawsuit could occur. Absolutely. And I think it's a great point. You're going to, you're going to make sure your, your insertion in the operating agreement and the PPM, you want to say partners and former partners. So you want to bind and you want to make sure that this um, – this stays in effect even after the no longer partners and even after the partnership's not there. The rules actually also deal with liquid partnerships that no longer are in existence and how does the IRS go after those partners. So you want to make sure that's dealt with. The other thing we deal with is also that this is really a partner expense so that we don't want to affect the incentive allocation or the preferred return, I mean, not the preferred, or the incentive allocation or the carry. And we don't want, generally want to affect the management fees, although less so on the management fees. But we don't want to affect the incentive, and we do want to have people, partners, reimburse the partnership for the, the taxes due. And what really gets, you know, a trifecta of the the latter scale, I would call it, is what happens if you have partners that have received remuneration for a guaranteed payment for putting in capital versus income, and if it's not addressed, it really causes some scary calculations to try to figure out who owes what. So, you know, it's, there's no what's called preferential treatment of like a senior subordinated debt here, Phil. It's mm -hmm. actually the, the calculation should be represented ahead of time. If you've got a very interesting waterfall calculation, there should be some connotation as to how your, your liability should be incurred to the individual partner and I don't mean individual as a person, but to each partner, I should say, mm -hmm. as to what their potential liability could be in these situations. So considering the yes. additional issues that we have, not only do we talked about now the partner issues, but now what could be the potential partnership representative issues with liability, Phil? Um, there, it's, it's, uh, the partnership representative, especially if you're an outside person, you're, you, but you you want to be held liable as long as you don't do anything wrong, really, as long as you don't do it intentionally wrong. Because there, the general, the partnership representative is going to have to weigh different determinations. If Robert's a former partner, I'm an existing partnership. There's a partner. There's a conflict between us. So, you know, as I said, I always try to maintain as much flexibility with it. Just the ultimate desire to try to in the tax and the interest and penalties on the partners that were partners in the review year. Uh, would you consider, is there anything explicit that you would definitely make sure that was in the partnership agreement? Yeah, uh, Dave will get into, I think, just the indemnification of partnership representatives will be an important uh, requirement. If I'm going to be a partnership representative or that designated individual, I want to make sure I'm, I'm indemnified by the partnership. Dave? Yeah, thank you. You know, so as Rob said earlier, this position is like Oz, all powerful. And we know from experience, anytime you accept a fiduciary role combined with large dollars, potentially large dollars at stake, there's a chance that the parties that feel hurt by a decision will sue. So because of this possibility, we believe the partnership representative should be protected by indemnifications in a contract or in our case, a service agreement and that there should be adequate DNO insurance in place. The partnership will also want to make sure the coverage has a tail that would cover any actions that the partnership representative has taken, and that partnership representative is no longer in place. And finally, as, as uh, Rob has, has mentioned, his conversation with a few states, um, <clears throat> we've not heard from any states that they've taken a position on the new federal re regulation 
However, if the IRS's hope comes true and that the regulations make their life easier and allows them to collect more tax revenue from the partnerships, then it would be a good guess that the states will follow suit. And, you know, why why did we get into this business and why do why do we at CSC believe that we're a good choice at, when needed to choose a third-party service provider? Well, CSC has been operating since 1989. We've been around for 120 years and five years from now, 10 years from now, when a letter is received by us from the IRS, we'll still be here to receive that letter and act on it. We've set up a designated uh, mailbox that all mail goes to. So even if the designated individual were to leave our company and we need to replace that person, we'll still receive and act on the mail. In fact, last year we received over a million pieces of mail and, pro and our requirement is to process them within 24 hours. And we've been, um, we've been serving in similar roles, either as a trust trustee or independent director and so we have experience taking on what we call a passive role to start and then moving into an active role. And that change would take place when we receive a letter from the IRS. And to the best of my knowledge, we're the only company that's been invited to Washington, D.C., to a third-party service provider to meet with the IRS to discuss the partnership representative role. So with that, we've come to the end of our presentation.